you notice the connection between a person's spiritual resilience and a person's gratitude to God? There's a tremendous connection, a tremendous uh, similarity. It's like the two things go together. What's that? Symbiotic relationship. I not use big words. I read something recently that said that people who hear people speaking, if you use big words, they think you're stupid. Did you come across that? Yeah, well, there you go. I tried to think you're stupid this morning. And there's this symbiotic relationship between people, you know, between your praise life and your spiritual resilience and your ability to just keep, keep it going. Gratitude to God expressed through the discipline of praise. Now we're looking at Psalm 34, and here's a song David's written for those who find it difficult to make that link. Difficult to make that link between, you know, gratitude to God and perseverance. And it springs from an interesting episode in David's own life. It's not some theoretical, super spiritual pain in the neck speaking here. This is David, and it's for real. You come across people like that, they say, oh well, rejoice in the Lord, you know. You just want to strangle up. Yeah? No wonder you do, I can see on your face, you do. We all do, right? We come across people like that, you know, you're having a tough time, and somebody comes to you, well, rejoice in the Lord, thank you so much. Take that. Rejoice about that. So, so it's not one of those that's talking here. It's David. And it comes out of a... The whole psalm comes out of an experience in his life that's a real challenge and a real difficult one. So first of all, we need to take note of the historical background and the life setting of this psalm. So this is about uh, the setting in life that David's song is all about. 1 Samuel 20 and 21. Yes, I know you were in your quiet time there yesterday. Yeah. 1 Samuel 20 and 21. What happens is this. David is brought to the point where for all his loyalty to King Saul, Saul's jealousy has risen to dangerous levels. And there's this conversation that takes place between David and Jonathan, his best mate, who happens to be Saul's son. And Jonathan just can't believe that his father Saul has really got it so in for David, but he has. And it's proven by a little test they do to check it out. And Jonathan and Saul have this marvellous meeting where he's firing arrows. Do you remember the one from Sunday school? We did Sunday school, just as a matter of interest. Who went to Sunday school as a kid? Wow, that's a lot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight? Wow, that's a huge number. Fantastic. Well, you remember the story of David and Jonathan and shooting arrows, yeah? And if it goes beyond, and that's the story for those who've got it. For all his loyalty to King Saul, David is in a position where Saul now really does want to do him in. And David has been secretly anointed by Samuel to be the next king after Saul. So it's all a bit tense and difficult. Jonathan and David, they swear loyalty to one another, and Jonathan has worked out, yes, it is true about Saul, his father wants to do away with David. So Jonathan finally encourages David to flee, and David has got the sense, and off he goes. And he finds himself, ultimately, in the Philistine city of Gath, ruled by King Achish. Now why that's dodgy is that David has been leading the armies of Israel against the Philistines, but that's where he ends up. And Achish's men weren't so daft that they picked up David's presence in their city. And they went to the king and they said, hey, look who's here. Well, they didn't. They said this. The servants of Achish said to him, isn't this David the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. So David's now in a really, really perilous situation. Fleeing from Israel's king, whose armies he's led against the Philistines, in order to preserve his own life, David has run straight into the arms of Achish, the old enemy. He's gone rapidly from frying pan to fire, and he knows it. And David says in 1 Samuel 21, 12, David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. He was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. But the strategy. He's really up against it. This is the guy who's been the army commander. He's, he's not a guy for playing the goat. You know? He's a serious sort of man. He's a serious individual, as we would say. And there he is, reduced to that. And so Achish said to his servants, Look at the man, he's insane. Why bring him to me? Am I so short of madmen? You have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? Must this man come into my house? 
David is behaving, for the sake of his skin, like the sort of person you wouldn't want in your house because they're not quite. It's precisely as a result of that that he is delivered, and it is precisely as a result of that deliverance, not David's most glorious hour, but possibly his God's most merciful, that the heading tells us this psalm was written about. Okay? That's what you're dealing with in this psalm. Now, of course, you're going to say to me, Simon, we've looked at it, we've got our Bibles open and we can see. Well, yeah, because you're going to look at the wall. But on the heading of the psalm, it, it uses a different name. It says Abimelech. When David feigned madness in the presence of Abimelech, and of course, one Samuel tells us the king's name was Achish. So what's going on? Well, Abimelech means son of the king. And it looks like what the Philistines used to call a king who inherited his throne peacefully. Do you see the point? So Achish was known as Abimelech, honorary title, something like Pharaoh or Uranus. Right? So that's what's going on. Achish was the king of Gath at the time. He was the one known as Abimelech in those days. So Achish 1 Samuel 21 seems to be the contemporary Philistine king. He is the one who's being referred to, and that's the background to this psalm. So what have we got emphasized in this psalm? Did you notice? Don't want them again. Um, you take the Hebrew text of Psalm 34, all of it, and you slam it into a wordle generator, and you come up with this. Oh, it's ever so sad that might have been. So dismal, isn't it? Um, but look, here, here are the words that are emphasised. The biggest words are the ones that are emphasised the most. And for our help and our guidance, I've got a red ring around the ones that are emphasised the most. Do you feel helped? Or perplexed? <laughs> okay, it's quite pretty, so enjoy that. <laughs> here are three words that are the same, effectively. This word is the most emphasised word in the whole psalm. This is the same word, but with a bit on the front of it. <coughs> and this is the same word, but with a bit on the front of it. Can you see that? Yeah. That word is, well, we'd say Yahweh or Jehovah, the faithful covenant keeping God. That's his name. There's the name. And then there's two other forms that come next in proliferation, meaning and the Lord or of the Lord. Right? This one means and the Lord. And this one means of the Lord. So the Lord is pretty much the focus of the entire thing, right? In his perplexity, in his whatever, David had an encounter with God who delivered him, and he's making big of God in his psalm as a result. Does that make sense? God is central. Front stage centre, big on the screen. God's in the picture magnificently. It's all about his God again. So, you know, given that Actually, God is the biggest in there. And then there's these two other words that mean to God or of God. I mean, God would be a lot bigger naturally, wouldn't he? If, if it weren't just... Yeah, okay. Flogging the dead horse, move on. Right, so the next one... Perhaps that's another heavily emphasised uh, little word there. And uh, that word is Yahweh. It refers to those who fear. God's the biggest emphasis. The next one is those who fear... That God. Is that making sense? Those who fear the Lord. Significant emphasis in this psalm is that those with a healthy respect for the sovereignty of God end up in the right sort of relationship with Him. That's not a common theme, is it? In contemporary theology, those who fear the Lord end up in the right sort of relationship with Him, a saving relationship. And then the next word that's emphasized, and I, I thought this would be kind of interesting, that, that word uh, means evil, but the way it's constructed is away from evil. Then there's this word shama, and that means heard, as in he heard my cry. So putting that all together then, here's a passage where the Lord is by far and away the biggest element on the screen, and next comes an emphasis on turning away from evil, and the Lord hearing his cry, because he's feared the Those are the repeated emphases of this psalm. There's a tremendous amount more than that happening along the way, and, and it's time we got to that. Okay, the first half, we're not going to get past the first half of this psalm today, because, you know, you all want lunch, don't you? Yeah? Boring, isn't it? But you will want lunch, and by the time I get there, you certainly will. So, verses 1 to 10 today, 
He's saying rejoice. The first half of the psalm is all about rejoicing. The second part of the psalm is, let me teach you the way of wisdom. Let me teach you the way to live that will get you into this pathway of rejoicing. Okay? So when you go home, you can do verses 11 onwards, that's fine. That's, that's the way of wisdom that gets you into this life of rejoicing at the deliverance of God. Does that make sense? Thank you. Okay, so the first half of the psalm, then, this rejoice bit, he's saying rejoice, verses 1 to 10. And, and that's odd, because it, um, the way it works out is that he switches back and forth between personal testimony and repeated invitations to join in the praise, and by doing so, stir up fresh faith. It's just, it seems a bit chaotic. Now it's not, because it's a very carefully crafted psalm. But it's not crafted with a structure that follows the logic of what he's saying. It's got an external structure. It's what's known as an acrostic poem. You know what an acrostic is? It's where each successive line of the poem starts with the next letter of the alphabet. Try doing that. It's not easy. Right? And he's done it. He's done it in Hebrew. It doesn't help you at all because you're not looking at it in Hebrew and we're not likely to do that. We'll breathe a sigh of relief. Okay? We're not doing that. But it is well thought out. It just seems like he's all over the shop. And he's not. The same thoughts are there. They're logical, sensible thoughts. But... The structure will not be apparent to us because it's in Hebrew. Happy bunnies? That'll change. So, the message is simple then. God has been great to me. Come on and rejoice. Now, of course, we may well tend to think that if someone is low, and if somebody is struggling, the last thing we should do is make statements like this in their hearing. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. You might think that's the wrong thing to do. What's David doing? He's doing exactly that. But he's doing it in a particular way. Now I guess he said I'll extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. And he says all times. More exactly, he says at every time. And it's the more so a, a glaring thing, given the recent experience of Gath, where he's been, you know, fooling around in front of Achish. It's not mindless, this. It's, it's a resolution to praise God at all times, but it's rooted in his, in his realities and the realities of his life. Now look, if you go through the Psalms, have you noticed how many of the Psalms are laments? One third of the psalms take the form of a public lament, <coughs> expressing human sorrow and struggling. And there's a real readiness in scripture in general, in psalms in particular, to acknowledge, and most importantly, to express human sorrow and struggling and take it back to God. It's that last bit that's important, bit, isn't it? There's no reluctance about that in scripture. But there's the other thing too, which we can very wrongly feel we have to suppress in order to help the downcast. Does it help the downcast person to reflect back misery to their misery? Now sometimes there's a measure of that involved here. But actually what David is trying to do is to address the downcast. This isn't a charter for a lack of care. It needs to be an expression of care to speak as the psalmist does. But he's rooting it in reality and he's trying to encourage. And build up. Here's how it all works out. And as I said, it's all over the place. So we've just got blobs. But they fall into a pattern. Because he makes an initial appeal in verse 3. And then he backs that up with his own personal history, verse 4. And then a lesson for life, verse 5. Then his own personal history again in verse 6. And then a lesson for life again in verse 7. And then an appeal again in verses 8 to 9a. And then he shows the importance of that appeal. Verses 9b. Can you see how it all fits together? It starts with an appeal, it finishes with an appeal. And then he's wobbling between these two stools. Is that making sense? And we'll see. Because we're going to work through it. So here's this statement of purpose then. Here's what he's about. Here's his declared plan and purpose. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I'll glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Who should rejoice? The person who's got enough problems of his own. I can tell him something good that's happened. Let's see if I can help him rejoice. Do you see? Now that's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? Got to be careful how you do that. He's going to be careful. But 
here's where he's trying to go. And that's made more clear in the final appeal, in verses 8 and so on at the end. So here's the appeal then to start with. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Together. David has come to the conclusion on the basis of his experience of God's deliverance, both at the court of Saul and down at Gath, that he is always determined, always to praise the God who's done this for him. And more than that, he will not keep the joy to himself. Now that's, that's interesting. He will not keep the joy to himself. There are people out there whose lives are broken and afflicted and humbling and humiliating for them. And as he has such great cause to rejoice in God himself, David wants to pass on some of that for their benefit. Why do you want to share your good news about the Lord? I think you've got good news about the Lord in you, have I? And it's not always easy to find it. I, I know it's not. Like, trust me. You know, I've got teenage kids to remind me when I'm being a grumpy old guy. It's brilliant. He wants to pass on some of the joy. Not to deny the pain, not to deny the sorrow, not to deny the struggles, but to try and pass on some of the good news of God that he's got. Why do you want to share your good news about the Lord? David's got lessons to teach us here. And here's where he starts with a direct and a personal appeal. I have reason to rejoice, he says, verse 3, glorify the Lord with me. Please join me. Please rejoice with me. Now this is a bit of an Eastern thing. Um, do you remember the, uh, the, the parables Jesus tells in Luke 15 about the lost everything? Yeah? Well, not lost everything, but the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. There's, there's this appeal that goes on with, with the lost son. And the lost doesn't start there, it starts with the sheep. There's an appeal that goes on, the sheep is found. Rejoice with me! I found my lost sheep! Oh, great man, that's fantastic! Oh, cool! Woman lost a coin off a betrothal set, you know, uh, lost, oh, it's a long story. Lost in the house, right? And uh, she makes a big search and it cleans the whole house. Uh, at the end of the day, she finds the coin and she calls all her neighbors and says, Rejoice with me, I lost the coin, it's missing off a bit of kit, you know. Rejoice with me. Yeah? And there's an obligation to rejoice with those who rejoice, as well as to mourn with those who mourn. We've lost, we've, we've kept the one, we've lost the other in our culture at the moment. And then, the point of what Jesus is saying to those Pharisees in the beginning of Luke 15 is you should be rejoicing that the lost are found, not being miserable about it. So here's David, long before that, saying, glorify the Lord of me, I've got reason to rejoice. Let us exalt his name together, please. You'll feel better. You'll feel great. Rejoice with me. He speaks as one who has been afflicted, and certainly feigning madness before the Philistine king of Gath to try to save your own miserable skin. That's going to be an afflicting experience, a humbling experience, for the sort of serious guy that David was. And speaking as one who's been through all of that, he appeals to others in similar circumstances, not by saying, oh yes, I know how you feel, oh you poor thing. I'm sure he's happy to do that. But by saying, oh, oh look, I, I was there, but look what God has done for me, and therefore look what God can do for you. Yeah? There's hope in it. There's hope in it. And what's happened is that this statement of purpose, verses 1 to 2, I will rejoice, has been kind of fellowshipped up to others who are also in fellowship with the same covenant keeping God, who is, is, is their hope of the sort of deliverance that they need to see. Come on, David says, my God is your God, and look what he's done for me. At least. That is the direction that David wants to take with people, and I don't know how they're going to respond. But he's going to give it a whack, you know? There's the appeal. Then in comes the personal history. This isn't pie in the sky. I sought the Lord. He answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. The word for fear that arises here is not the one that arises elsewhere in the psalm. It's a more intense word for craven fear. It's quite possibly not so much the events that are dreaded, but the dread that takes hold of the man. You know, in the early hours of the morning, the dread creeps up. That's what he's talking about. And David's recital of his own personal history with God is crucial to working out his determination to praise, and also to his appeal to the rest of God's covenant people to praise with him, whatever their current circumstances. Now, okay, look. 
come to some length already to describe David's situation down at Gath, where he fled, and the unjust persecution of Saul, who he only served and done good for, and, and how he found then that down in, in Gath, he jumped from the frying pan into the fire, and, and you can see him, can't you, trying to live beneath the radar in a hostile environment, you know, waiting to be picked up. And you can see him as the guys come to the door and they pick him up and they haul him off and he's in, he's in the court of his enemy whose men he has killed and put to the sword dramatically. And you can see him in that situation praying his way, praying his way, praying his way and finding a strategy and putting it in place and having to humble himself to the extent that he's dribbling on his own beard and scratching on the nose. He's come down. He's come low. And in that context, David sought the Lord. Because they picked up on that song, you know, that they used to sing, the victory song. David has slain his thousands, but Saul, but, 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 uh, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. And that's come back to bite him in the butt now, isn't it? And at that time he sought God. And at that time, God delivered David and delivered him from all that craven fear being in the hands of the enemy. I saw something in, in BBC News uh, this week. Stories are beginning to come out from... Um, do you remember a little while ago there was a, a, a gas plant uh, in um, uh, Libya and a bunch of terrorists took it over and whatnot and the guys were in the plant, they were hiding behind the fire and cabinets and all the rest of it. And there's a kind of the craven terror of falling into the hand of an enemy. David was there. All was horribly and unutterably lost or so it began. His fears ran at a terrifying, never before known high. And at that time he saw God and God delivered David and delivered him from all the things he feared. So here comes the lesson David learned from that experience. There is personal history. Here's the lesson for life. Those who look to him are radiant. I'm not sure David looked very radiant at that point, are you? Their faces are never covered with shame. His, his face was covered with the spitting dribble to make himself look like a nutcase. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. There's the point, there's the principle. David had looked to God, who seems to have given him a thoroughly humbling strategy for a man like David, the Philistine killer, to pursue. It was a course of action that, from a human perspective, a proud man's perspective on life, was humbling and humiliating and shaming, playing the madman to escape the vengeance of your enemy, your God's enemy, your people's enemy. And what's David's take on it now? After he's come through that experience, playing the fool, dribbling in his beard, pulled it off, being derided for his ins insanity, those who look to him are radiant. What are you thinking, Old Testament, when you read that? Moses. Yeah. got to be Moses, isn't it? Because Moses goes up the mountain and go meets with the glory of God and looks upon the glory of God in some way we don't understand. And when he comes down, his face is shining with that glory. He's reflecting that back. It's radiating that glory to the world around him. He has looked on God. He's been with God. And his face is radiant because of it. And there's David, outwardly playing the madman and dribbling and stuff, scratching the doors. And uh, he's saying, oh, but those who look to God, they're radiant. And although his face is covered, oh no, those who look to God, their faces are never covered with shame. Do you know that experience of feeling ashamed that doesn't belong to you? very important that we deal with shame that doesn't belong to us. Shame that's already been nailed to a cross. Paul has to deal with that with those Roman Christians, you know. There is therefore now no condemnation. no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. A very easy verse to learn, isn't it? Didn't you think? It's an early one we teach new Christians, isn't it? It's an important one. A very hard one to learn in the cut and thrust and the trouble and the battling through life, isn't it? To be applying that daily. No, people are putting shame on me, there's no shame. Because I'm in Christ Jesus. And David's had that experience of being outwardly shamed. And he uses take on it. 
is my lesson for life. Those who look to him radiant, he says, their faces are never covered with shame. Where obedience to God seems to others and to you to be shaming. Do you know that experience? Humiliating? I remember years and years and years ago, you knew me as long ago as that. Um, picture appeared on a mantelpiece of me preaching in the open air in Oxford in my donkey jacket and with a beard and with sketchbook and paints. Uh, just, just preaching and, and yeah, I know, it's hard to think now, I'm such a picture of respectability. But, but there I was, youth student, you know, preaching on May morning, five or six o'clock in the morning or something, just preaching on a sketchbook and, and there's, you know, sorry Tom to disappoint you, I had a youth. And there I was preaching away and uh, a certain respectable auntie who was part of my dad's Roman Catholic family came in and she saw this and she turned to my recently bereaved mother and she said, Oh Mary, aren't you ashamed of your son? Can you imagine? Can you imagine the devastation <laughs> that's wrought on an unbelieving, recently believed mother? Can you imagine? Is that a shame? That's not a shame. There are times when the world around us will seek to pour shame on us for things that are not shameful, but glorious. Those who look to him are radiant, their faces are never covered with shame. So much more to say about that, better move on. So he goes back to his personal history again, you see. He's not just telling you something. He's saying, look, this is rooted in the reality that I know. The poor man, this poor man called, verse 6, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. David's back in Gap, isn't he? He's a poor man, exposed, under threat, no human strength or help to meet his challenges, on his own. Troubles were plenty. Help was non-existent. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. Nobody else is listening. He saved him. Out of all his troubles. And again, that's not just whoopie doo smile, Jesus loves you stuff. That's for living by, says David, I live by that. David's personal history has taught him God. God's ways are not our ways. And here comes the derived lesson for life. This poor man called and the Lord heard him, right? Rescued him out of all his troubles. What's the lesson for life? Well, here's the reason for it. The angel of the Lord caps round about those who fear him. Do you know that verse? Please learn that verse. <laughs> that is a really important verse. I've no idea about you, but I've, I've definitely been in threatening situations where that one verse has been very important to me. I can remember the first time. I can remember the last time. When even your life seems to be threatened and things have got sticky, that verse is a cracker to have with you. The Lord camps around about those who fear him. He delivers them. David is there away from his armies, away from his encampments, with no, nothing going for him, not even a weapon in his hand, only dribble on his beard. Right? And he says, look, this is what I discovered when I cried out to the Lord in that context. I didn't need to worry about the lack of an army, because the angel of the Lord was camped around me, delivering me, protecting me. Too many stories to tell. In any event, the highest power flying out of heaven, says David, from his own scary experience, God's special, also powerful messenger, very often God himself is referred to as the angel of the Lord. It's a complicated picture in the development of the Old Testament. I have discovered this, the angel of the Lord encamps round about those who fear him, and he delivers them. Now, if that's the case, don't you want to fear God? See, we, we, we live in a world where... Um, you know, that's completely countercultural. The very suggestion that the fear of God could be healthy is, <gasps> yeah, because our sin cries out against that. That's healthy. Now here comes the appeal again. Appeal in verses 8 to 9a. And this now chimes with that first appeal, challenging with the first one, at the start of the section, links to the links to it from the end of the section, sort of closing the brackets around it, completing the section of the psalm. You see how it goes? He got some logical sort of introduction we can grasp, and then he's got these bits blobbed about, which are great, and then he's got this concluding appeal at the end, say so there are the brackets, there's the section. What's the concluding? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. Where did David have to go to come to that conclusion? What did he have to taste in his mouth? To be able to see that God is good. Do you know the taste of fear? Do you know that tinny sort of taste? Do you know the taste? Taste and see that God is good. A 
those days. And because he's good, of course, there is no harm in fearing him. Because God is good, there's no hurt in fearing this God. He's nothing but good to me. But I stand in awe of his majesty. David's point here is that those less willing to praise God than deliver David himself need to take themselves off to the tasting session. The way to grasp, get this, the way to grasp the goodness of God in the land of the living is to get out there and grasp living out the fear of God in the faith-inspired life, taking refuge in him for the consequences of that faith-inspired life, depending on him for the outcome. Dangerous, isn't it? No, because the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Do you know, we sometimes have too many other refuges that we can just nip into. It's not always good for us. And you might not be able to rationalise the conclusion that God is good. Certainly, you know, you listen to some of the sort of media atheists in our world. Um, I don't mean this sort of Hawkins and all those, all those guys and Atkins and all that. I don't, I don't mean those. I mean um, the comedians and the, uh, the people who present, you know, um, who's the guy who presents QI? What's his name? Stephen Fry. Stephen Fry, you know. He was there a few weeks ago again. You know, some little bug that does some horrible thing in the natural world saying, how can anybody conceive that it could possibly be a, a loving God? Stephen, you need to get off your self-righteous backside taste that God is good when all chips are down. That's how you find out the goodness of God. Taste and see that the Lord is good and that blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. You won't know that logically. You won't know that by, by philosophical analysis. You'll know that by having to take refuge in him. And seeing what he's like to you then. Fear the Lord. You, his holy people, says David. And you'll know the goodness of God after the tasting session. You won't be able to rationalise to that conclusion that God is good, but some things are evident to the reflective practitioner, to use the jargon, that never dawn on secluded academics. Just taste, says David, and see that the Lord is good. And that blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And finally for today, did you, did you know? Finally, there it was. There it was. Finally for today, here's how it winds up. The importance of that appeal is, is, is just reinforced. The appeal again chimes in, you see, and then completing this section, the importance of that. Why is it important to put your trust and find your refuge in him and fear that God for those who fear him lack nothing? What? you believe that? Can you believe that? Those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good things. Repeat it. He's got to repeat it because we find it hard to believe in the first place. A big motivating conclusion set to all of this appeal, this recital both of experience and the way of wisdom, is that it makes sense to fear the Lord because those who fear him lack no Good thing. Lions. Where, where, where do lions come in the food chain? <laughs> yeah, you watch those programs as well. They certainly do. There you are, the lion is there, chewing away at the antelope because he's on the colour. So it be in the second though, because we have guns so we could kill the lion. Yes, but in their environment and in their habitat where we do not belong with guns. Said he wriggling and getting out of that reasonably well, I thought. <laughs> the lion is at the top of the naturally natural list of predators, yeah? You're right, Caleb, okay, yeah, but fair enough. They didn't have guns in those days, and we're not talking about that. Well, they, as had, as my they had both. In normal circumstances, as conceived by the bulk of humanity, <laughs> the lion <laughs> is at the top of the food chain. How often will a lion go hungry? Well, you do find lions go hungry, they go hungry when they get old. When they get worn out, when their teeth, you know, the ashes are gone, there's no falsies, yeah? They're all worn down. But actually, David here uses a different sort of word. He uses, he uses the word kefir, which means young lions. An old lion may conceivably be less fit, active, therefore less able to hunt effectively. But even young lions, he says, even the young lions, they may, in extreme circumstances, they, even they may grow weak and hungry. 
seek the Lord. Lack no good thing. Now we put it very clear about this. Because walking with the Lord and walking where He leads us and following His path, we may lack some things. We may lack some things. If you don't know that, if you need me to tell you that, what you can do it. We may lack some things. But seeking Him, we will lack no good thing. When things are tough, it is desperately easy to fail to give God the credit that he's due, it won't help you to go there. It will not help you to go there. And it's David's business in this Psalm 34 today to keep us from going there. Whatever casts us down, whatever legitimate thing we can lay hold of to say, I hurt. There are many. There are going to be times when we need people like David to come along and urge on us songs of praise that are born of their experience, because our experience isn't leading us there at that moment. Because at the moment, praise is not something that naturally springs out of our hearts, because our experience wouldn't take us there. And we need him, we need the guy to do that, because those who seek the Lord are the ones who actually lack no good thing. We need to pray for one another, you know, because we, we do see friends struggling. We don't know what to do. Do you find that so often? You, you, you see people hurting and struggling. And, and well, you know, huh, you're supposed to be the pastor. You don't know what to say. You say the wrong thing. Quite often. Sorry about that. I really do apologise in advance. It's going to happen again. I will. And, and, you know, you're a sensitive Christian person and, and you, you're known as that. But you will, you will still put your foot in it. You still say the wrong thing, however hard you try. Those who seek the Lord are the ones who actually lack no good thing. I'm sorry if it hurts, guys. We've got to get hold of that because it won't help you not to. Let's pray for one another. When we see friends are struggling, let's seek always to sensitively encourage one another. Why do we come back here to prayer? Why do we say, God has answered my prayer? Why is it that on teams and students and stuff like that, from the earliest, my earliest experience, we've always gone out and we've, we've done some door to door, we've done some open air, we've done whatever it is it happens to be, and we come back to pray afterwards, and somebody's been able, to, somebody's had a really hard day, <laughs> you know, they've been sort of chewed badly by some militant Buddhist or something, and, and they come back, you know, and uh, somebody's been able to say, oh, I've had a great time, and talk to such and such a person, and you... You see people's spirits rise. And you see faith renewed and built. The covenant community of the people of God has got to be a team. And it's no good if there's only one coach. No. Rugby teams don't have one coach anymore. They don't even have one captain anymore. Rejoice with me, says David. Rejoice with me. Look how good God has been. And He's real. And the other good thing.